Our third speaker of the day is Ilya Katzel, the head of data science at Grid Dynamics. Today, he'll be talking about emerging techniques that help better personalization solutions. We're looking forward to hearing more. To connect with speakers like Ilya and other attendees, you can go in our app, into Slack or on Twitter. These are all opportunities to adapt and lean on a virtual community that's here for you as we all elevate this industry. So jump on in, we're here for you. And now let's get to Ilya's talk. Hello, thank you for joining this session of Data Science Salon. My name is Ilya Kasov. I'm head of Data Science at Grid Dynamics and uh, I will be talking about personalization and fraud detection using event sequences analysis. So first of all, let me introduce Grid Dynamics. Uh, we are a data science and software engineering consulting company headquartered in Silicon Valley, and uh, we work with many large retail, manufacturing, technology, and finance companies on innovative programs related to data science and industrial AI in the areas of customer intelligence, personalization, price management, supply chain optimization, risk management, fraud detection, and so on. And in this talk, uh, I will be presenting some of the uh, lessons that we learned uh, through doing this uh, project of these companies. So essentially the agenda for this talk is very simple. Uh, I'm going to cover just two topics. First one is uh, why do we need to account for event sequences and customer analytics? Why are we interested in this topic at all? And the second uh, question is uh, how exactly we can implement this? How can we account for event sequences for different uh, use cases, different applications like churn prediction, customer segmentation and uh, fraud detection? So um, let's start with uh, a brief overview, uh, brief a reminder of uh, what um, we typically do when we develop uh, personalization models uh, or product recommendation models or something like that. So typically we start with some um, uh, customer data that can include demographic information, order history, uh, behavioral data like click stream and so on. And ideally this data should be available in uh, some um, uh, relational form that we can easily aggregate. And then we produce uh, different aggregated features for customers, and we can also produce different aggregated features for uh, products or items. And then we define some outcome label that we are generally interested to predict. It can be probability of click, probability of conversion, uh, lifetime value, or um, uh, probability of fraud, or something like that. And then we have a variety of algorithms uh, that we can use to implement different use cases. We can use techniques like lookalike modeling like collaborative filtering, survival analysis, clustering, anomaly detection to uh, implement uh, offer personalization, implement uh, product recommendations uh, and so on. And this is how uh, the typical, uh, typical approach looks like. And of course it works uh, reasonably well and widely used all across uh, the industry. But at the same time there are several limitations, several shortcomings with this approach. The first one is that um, Interactions with customers, they are sequential in nature. Typically, once we interact with customers, we have sequences of clicks, or we have sequences of transactions. And uh, once we are doing aggregation, we can lose this information on aggregation. It, of course, depends on how exactly we produce our aggregated features, but in general, we are losing some information this way. And the second problem is that um, information about customer behavior, it's not necessarily available in the form of um, uh, this relational representation, this nice relational tables, but it can be available only in the form of application logs or um, something like that. And typically we need to spend quite a lot of time trying to understand the semantics of these logs and trying to develop some meaningful um, feature aggregation uh, processes for that, do uh, all, uh, all necessary data engineering and feature engineering. And um, uh, this is also um, a substantial problem in, uh, in most practical applications, of course. And in this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on these uh, two problems and uh, present several techniques that uh, we uh, found to be, um, uh, to be efficient and useful in, um, in development of uh, personalization models and addressing these problems. So first, let's start with um, with a case study around uh, churn prediction. And uh, essentially the same approach is applicable not only to churn prediction, but to majority of propensity scoring problems uh, in general. In these problems, we're interested in predicting a certain customer state or a certain event, certain outcome. It can be churn, it 
can be product return, it can be conversion, or it can be something different. And uh, also explaining what drives customer into this state. So in other words, if we have uh, some sequence of events uh, like shown in here, um, for example, um, web clicks or uh, calls to the customer, uh, support or uh, interaction with mobile application, then um, uh, be generally interested in uh, understanding for some event of interest like product return or account cancellation, uh, how it relates to all other events in the sequence, what uh, caused this, um, this event, and also predicting this event uh, for customers who are not in this state yet, but approaching the state in the future, who take some mitigation, a mitigating action, for example, provide uh, a retention offer or um, or a discount or something like that. And uh, we generally can approach this problem using lookalike modeling through aggregating these events into some statistics like frequency of purchases, uh, recency of purchases, and so on, standard things. Uh, but this is not necessarily optimal. And um, uh, one of the basic techniques that we can use, we can use models with sequential inputs. For example, in here, uh, it has shown uh, how um, we can apply LSTM models to these problems. So basically, uh, in case of LSTMs, we um, are not aggregating uh, events into aggregated features, but we uh, represent customer journey as a sequence of events, and we just need to engineer uh, event level features properly, like uh, what's the event type, what are the event attributes, and then we can feed the sequence of events into the LSTM model, and uh, it also can be used to uh, estimate probability of, of a certain event. And this approach, uh, it has certain benefit in our experience. First of all, it simplifies the feature design, of course, because it's easier to engineer features for individual events than to engineer good features for entire customer profile. And at the same time, it's very good in uh, improving accuracy, especially for uh, predicting events uh, in early stages of uh, customer journey. For example, if we have just a few events in customer journey and we are interested in early predicting uh, the probability of churn to have enough time to take some mitigating action, then uh, this approach is generally superior to uh, models with aggregated features. Uh, but at the same time, this is just a basic solution and um, there are some limitations. Uh, one of the major limitations of basic LSTM model is that it does not provide an easy way to estimate contributions of individual events into the outcome. And this is important from explainability perspective and also important for some other applications like uh, attribution, like channel attribution. Um, so what we can do, we can extend uh, this basic LSTM model with uh, an attention layer, which is a standard technique developed in natural language processing. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of similarities between processing sequences of words and sequences of events uh, in our case. And uh, what attention layer does, it essentially assigns uh, weights for individual events in the customer journey. And we can extract these events from uh, the attention layer and um, can use them essentially as a measure of uh, contribution, measure of significance of each event in uh, any particular journey. And it also generally uh, improves the accuracy of the model, the attention layer. So, um, this way, if we interpret attention weights as contribution of events, we can uh, explain um, uh, the results of our model better and we can use it for propensity scoring uh, to estimate probability of different events. But we also can use the same approach for attribution problems because we can assign weights to different events. And if we group these weights, for example, by channel type or uh, by campaign, then we can estimate the contributions uh, of these channels or campaigns uh, in into the final event, and it essentially produces uh, an attribution model. Uh, and finally, we can use uh, these weights for clustering. We essentially can um, map each customer into, uh, into these weights on a certain sequence of events, some predefined sequence of events, and then do clustering in the space of these uh, weights to understand what are the typical sequential patterns uh, in customer behavior. So what typically, uh, uh, what typically drives customer to a certain state in terms of uh, some initial events and what are the typical patterns here. And this is also very, very insightful in many cases, especially in chart prediction. So this is, uh, this is one of the case studies. Um, uh, that shows how we can use LSTM models for uh, personalization. But uh, using uh, LSTM models, uh, either basic LSTM models or models with attention, it's, uh, it's still limited in the sense that uh, it's focused only on behavioral data, but in many applications, we also need to incorporate product attributes. 
uh, and um, uh, create features that uh, both reflect uh, behavioral information and uh, content information. Uh, and also, um, LSTM models still require to do some feature engineering, uh, at least at the level of individual events. But the question that we can pose is how can we um, develop more efficient process to, uh, uh, to work with unstructured data and extracting features from unstructured data, and also how we can admix some content data so we can produce uh, uh, feature vectors for products or feature vectors for customers that incorporate this uh, information and then these feature vectors can be used either for um, analytics uh, applications like clustering we can cluster customers or products in this space of these features or we can just use these features in some downstream models uh, like propensity models or charm models to improve uh, the accuracy uh, of our uh, of our forecasts, of our predictions, or uh, to, um, to simplify uh, feature engineering process. Uh, and actually, uh, we, can, um, we can accomplish this to a large extent by uh, realizing that uh, there is a similarity between um, natural language processing models, NLP models, and the problem that we are trying to solve, because we, uh, there are, of course, a lot of similarity between sequences of words and sequences of events. So, for example, uh, one of the techniques that we used on one of the projects uh, was uh, to represent um, behavioral information about customers in, uh, in a way that is similar to, um, uh, to representation of sentences and words. For example, we can uh, take orders and consider each order as a sentence and consider each product ID in the order essentially as a word, right, and represent each order as a sequence of these uh, product words. And then we can apply standard NLP models like uh, word to vec or doc to vec without any modifications to learn embeddings for, um, uh, for our products. And uh, actually these embeddings, they are very meaningful because if we will do, uh, for example, clustering of these embeddings, then we will see that these embeddings, they show some uh, behavioral information. They're able to capture some behavioral information. For example, uh, we can see that uh, customers' products uh, that um, correspond, for example, to healthy lifestyle, they uh, group into, uh, into clusters and other customers are grouped into other clusters. So this way we are capturing some useful semantics. And we can actually incorporate even uh, content information into this if we re replace product IDs with uh, different product attributes like product category or it can be a packaging size or some other attributes that in that case, we will be able to learn embeddings at the level of attributes, and then we can able to, and then we will be able to aggregate these attribute level embeddings into product embeddings, and then into customer embeddings, and then into session embeddings, and it can be applied to a variety of uh, personalization problems, to product recommendations, to um, uh, personalized authors and promotions and so on. And uh, one particularly uh, interesting uh, fact about this technique is that it can be applied not only to uh, this, uh, this aggregated uh, representation. We do not necessarily need to, um, to create this um, representation of orders and products and customers, but we can apply this technique directly to, um, uh, to server logs. Uh, typically, um, in application logs, we have uh, some timestamp, we have some event name, we have uh, some event attribute and this attribute value. Uh, for example, it can be some web click and information about, uh, uh, about the page, about uh, the product um, related to uh, this click on the website. And what we can do, we can just mechanically convert uh, these logs into uh, um, uh, in the set of tokens. For example, we can concatenate event name with attribute name with attribute value and represent each user just as a sequence of these, uh, of these tokens uh, that represent, each of these tokens will represent an individual event. And then again, we can apply word to vec or doc to vec to produce customer embeddings. And of course, this is a very, uh, very interesting technique because we're able to uh, generate uh, useful and meaningful embeddings uh, in essentially unsupervised way and uh, even without uh, uh, complex uh, data engineering or feature engineering because we do not even need to understand the semantics of these logs. We just mechanically produce these tokens. And uh, these embeddings actually, uh, they are very useful. They can be, um, again, uh, either used for clustering and for analytics, or they can be plugged in into downstream models as additional features or as a replacement of manually engineered features. 
Uh, and the first case study that uh, I wanted to show uh, is about fraud detection. So um, essentially this, uh, this case study is about a project that we did with uh, a video gaming company. So for that company, uh, their problem is that uh, they publish games, they run game servers, but they have uh, issue with uh, fraudulent activities. Some people are building programmatic farms uh, that um, essentially uh, represent a number of uh, gaming devices like gaming consoles that are connected to each other and programmed in some way to play against each other and earn some virtual currency and then they sell this virtual currency on, um, uh, on, on certain sites and so on. And the challenge is that uh, we, need to, uh, we need to take different metrics that we get from the gaming servers, like game durations, uh, virtual currency transfers, uh, game win rates. And um, based on these metrics, we need to identify these fraudulent activities. Essentially, we need to, um, uh, to uh, classify customer profiles as fraudulent or not based on uh, this metrics. And this is actually a challenging problem. One of the reasons why it is challenging is, uh, of course, because we have uh, very, uh, very imbalanced data sets. Uh, uh, fraud events are relatively rare, of course, uh, but also um, uh, there are some problems related to the fact that uh, it's actually in many cases it's very difficult to distinguish between fraudulent and not fraudulent uh, behavior because uh, of course people who are running these programmatic farms they're trying to mimic uh, regular gamers as much as possible and also there are some regular gamers who uh, play uh, you know play a lot and uh, their um, game intensity patterns are somewhat similar to uh, to programmatic farms to uh, you know in a way so um, uh, in this project, we started with some baseline solution initially. We did some manual feature engineering, uh, created features like game duration, intervals between the games, uh, some uh, in-game statistics, and used uh, basic models uh, like gradient boosted decision trees to, um, uh, to detect fraud. But it did not work very well, uh, partly because uh, of imbalanced data sets. Uh, of course, we took some measures to, um, to work around it, but still, uh, it's, it's a problem in this type of applications in general. Uh, and uh, our precision recall uh, metrics uh, were not very good uh, with this approach, uh, with these aggregated features. Uh, but the second attempt that we did, the second uh, technique that we tried was uh, a kind of uh, sequential modeling. So uh, what was done, we uh, took these different metrics and we just rendered uh, charts, rendered plots for these metrics uh, as images, uh, as you can see here. And these images essentially depict uh, game intensity, uh, uh, intervals between the games and so on, all these metrics that uh, were available to us. And then we used um, convolutional neural networks to process these images and to classify these images as fraudulent or not. So this is uh, a kind of a weird way of applying uh, sequential modeling. And of course, uh, another approach could be to use uh, LSTM like models or RNN like models. But uh, this technique actually uh, worked out pretty well and it was very easy to understand and very easy to troubleshoot. And uh, we got um, very good precision and recall metrics from, um, from the very beginning without any substantial tuning. And um, in general, this technique is, uh, is a very powerful way of uh, dealing with problems like that. Uh, potentially, we could um, obtain uh, similar results through uh, more careful feature engineering, uh, you know, through development of more advanced features and through tuning models with disaggregated features. Uh, but uh, in terms of level of effort, um, uh, this, uh, this approach with processing of um, Sequential data seems to be much more, much more powerful and much more simple comparing to uh, approach with aggregated features. So um, uh, finally, let me summarize uh, the benefits of, uh, of uh, sequential models that we observed uh, in this and other projects. So let's say that we initially have some, uh, some solution that is based on aggregated features. And uh, the question that we can ask, how can we improve uh, this initial solution? It can be uh, a propensity model, which can be a product recommendation model or something else. So um, 
uh, first of all, uh, one of the questions that, uh, first question that we need to ask is uh, what type of problem we are trying to solve. Uh, if we are trying to solve some sort of a propensity scoring problem, it can be chart prediction, that can be uh, optimization of conversions, then we can improve it through um, accounting for individual uh, events and accounting for temporal dependencies for order between the events. And uh, both LSTM models and uh, CNN models, they can help us to accomplish that as, as we uh, just discussed. In, uh, in this case studies. Uh, the second type of problem that we uh, might be interested to solve is uh, some type of attribution model or explainability problem. Uh, how do we uh, get better insights uh, into what drives customer in a certain state? And in that case, um, we, uh, we, might be, uh, we might be interested in estimating event contributions. Uh, through using LSTM with attention. Next, if we are uh, interested in customer analytics and doing some cluster, clustering of customers or clustering of products, then uh, we can benefit from learning embeddings in unsupervised way directly uh, from, um, uh, from uh, sequences of orders or sequences of products or even directly from application logs. And we can use NLP-like models uh, like word to vehicle or doc to vehicle to accomplish that. Um, and the same applies to um, the problem of um, simplified feature engineering. If we are looking to simplify our feature engineering process, then again, we can uh, use unsupervised embedding uh, learning uh, using NLP models like word to vec Or another approach is that we can uh, just replace models with aggregated features with uh, models that use um, individual events like uh, LSTMs. And in that case, uh, we will um, eliminate um, uh, the necessity to aggregate uh, the entire customer journeys, entire customer profiles into some meaningful set of features, which is generally difficult to do. And we will need just to uh, engineer features for individual events, which is generally simpler to do. So as you can see, there are a number of benefits uh, from using sequential input models. And uh, in general, we, uh, uh, we had many uh, positive results uh, in, in real projects using these techniques. So. Um, that's uh, that's pretty much it for this talk. Uh, thank you for attention. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you again.